the Dead Zone Containment Protocols from Mantic Games. Landmark by T.P. Pike. Sigma 9, Second Sphere Financial District, Blake Industries HQ. Beneath Mr. Blake's gray, expressionless exterior, a cold satisfaction was stirring. As he observed the live influx of data streaming to the giant numerical projection at the center of his vast tower top office, he knew he had finally done enough. He'd reached the miraculous point in business where he could simply sit and watch as the numbers rolled in. The flickering glow of the hologram revealed the lines on his tired face, as the otherwise dark, empty room revealed just how alone he had become in his relentless dedication to Blake Industries. None of this mattered to Mr. Blake. Experience had taught him self-reliance above all else. What mattered was the big number in the middle, the hard evidence that his endeavors, indeed his life, had borne fruit. Beyond his plexiglass walls, the glittering night cityscape of Sigma-9 Financial District shimmered to the horizon in every direction, stretching out as far as the eye could see, until it appeared almost to merge with a dense galactic vista overhead. The aesthetic value of the scenery was entirely lost on Mr. Blake. His focus now, as ever, was on the business at hand. In a few short moments, 45 years of work would reach its final, glittering conclusion. With every blink of his bloodshot eyes, the digits ticked over in rapid, uneven bursts as the grand total approached the billion mark. One unit short, the data froze. The projection flickered, twitching almost imperceptibly. Mr. Blake stared at the row of nines, narrowed his gaze, and waited. Just one more. Deep space cargo lanes, fifth sphere, the bridge of the Aqua Zeta, two hours earlier. Tom liked to do things slowly. Nothing for him was as satisfactory as a simple task done properly in his own time. Nobody took enough time over anything anymore. This was what humanity had lost, he felt, in their race to the stars, to riches to the grave. He wondered if a way of living still existed by which nothing at all could be subject to the mysterious and invisible urgency which had become so prevalent in the human condition, the daily curse which so corrupted the clarity of the mind. It was his thirty-first year alive, merely the end of the beginning of his life, and his search continued. Out here in the cargo lanes of the fifth sphere, Tom had found something he'd always known he needed, space to take his time over things. Piloting bulk cruisers like the Aquazetta was well within his competencies, but in truth, the cargo he carried and the route he ran was of no great concern. It was the space between that mattered to him. The Aquazetta happened to be a slow, creaky old heap, sturdy and squat, a one-man junker, broad and basic. Voyaging alone for months on end, he had finally found the time to think, to reflect, and to write his stories. Nothing stirred his mind, appealed to his secret heart, and cultivated his creative spirit so much as the endless magnificence of his daily backdrop. From out here, even the most industrial, smog-sickened systems looked beautiful in the glittering spacescape beyond the cockpit. Mankind had once gazed upon the stars from grassy meadows. Now Tom soared among them, and the magnificence of that fact was not lost on him. The universe needed stories now, just as it always had, maybe more than ever. Tom had long ago resolved that despite the multitude of ways humanity might change over the millennia, this particular fire would never ever burn out. He wondered if any of the other pilots out here were poets, thinkers, searchers. It seemed the right place for them, adrift as he was, floating amid the very elements from which existence was composed. This particular run was almost over, and soon Tom would set foot on corporation soil once again. He didn't like the thought of that. Granted, Nexus Psi was a newly discovered planet, relatively speaking, and far from being akin to the heaving monstrosities of the inner spheres. Even so, in the months between his previous two cargo contracts, he had seen the changes setting in. There was a distinct waft of corporation stench down there. Tom felt something close to anger when he dwelled upon the thought of another world going corporate. But swirling sadness soon blunted the sharp edges of that emotion, forming something closer to despair. Everything the corporation touched slowly died. Tom had experienced it firsthand, a hazard of this line of work. With each trip back to a new planet, he would see the character and color slowly draining from the faces of the men and women once dear to him, the aura and atmosphere fading from places he'd once gone to for quiet inspiration. The pace of change, of expansion, of conversion, was frighteningly rapid. The eagerness of corporate bids for new planets, the clamor of the baffling negotiations, and the hideous terminology of the auctions 
were all deeply unsettling. In this way, the infectious influence of the corporation spread like a plague from the core planets of the first galactic sphere all the way out to the frontier of the fifth. As far as civilization dared to venture, it was the way of the corporations, but it was not his way. These planets were, after all, worlds, fresh, unsoiled opportunities for a new start, for new thoughts. It was out of control, and it was turning the galaxy gray. If you were not a staunch pacifist, he might have had mind to join up with the Rebs, to see what could be done. Instead, he wrote, hoping his stories and thoughts might add a splash of color to the hearts, minds, and souls of those who felt themselves turning Corporation Gray on the inside. Some might call it subversion, but Tom simply knew how to kindle the human spirit in the face of monotony. He had faith in the purity of that, and where that might lead a person. It was time for re-enlightenment, and he intended to be among those who dared to cast the stones of stimulating truth. Still, at this moment, Tom found himself staring at an entirely black page on his data slate, closing his eyes and letting his mind wander. Soon he was falling asleep at the console again. A gentle orchestra of bloops and bleeps played his favorite lullaby as the systems of the Aquazetta went about their nightly work, following the pre-plotted path to Nexus Psi. The ship sailed on, and soon Tom's doze passed into a deep and comfortable space sleep. When the planet went dark, Disappearing from the Navicorp charts forever, Tom wasn't even close to noticing. Nexus Psi, Fifth Sphere, Accutech Hidden Weapons Research Facility, Sector M83. With a gentle squeeze of the trigger, the first round hit home, square between the eyes, perfect. As the punctured dummy wobbled and came to a rest, Elise lowered the exacto rifle from her eye line and peered down the range, satisfied with the shot. As you can see, gentlemen, K-Track rounds can be adapted to function in even the most sophisticated of rifles, with minimal compromise of either accuracy or range. So far, the onlookers were not giving much away. Five Accutech representatives were present to observe a demonstration, all high-clearance level officers of the Armament Research Division. The open-air range was floodlit under the twilight sky, but their faces seemed somehow partially shrouded in darkness shadows and suits. The panel, four humans, one alien, were all leading experts in weapons technology, warfare, and corporate strategy, who wouldn't miss a trick. She had to be careful, but that was why she had been sent. She didn't make mistakes. Elise took a deep breath and continued with what she hoped would look like icy poise. Beneath the business-like exterior, her heart was pounding. When a target takes a K-Track round, pain is only the beginning. Within a microsecond, 6,000 nanoprobes are deployed from within the micro-warhead, even in cases of full projectile penetration. Faster than pain is transmitted to the brain, tactical data is retrieved from the target and transmitted directly to the K-Track satellite network. Our encrypted Veriband signals are unjammable by any known methods. Believe me when I say that our relay and repeater stations are numerous, and rest assured we can deploy them to wherever your conflict takes you. She noticed one of them curl a lip in a kind of smirk and exchange a glance with his colleague. At least she knew they were listening. Our data bank is encoded with the full complement of current knowledge concerning biological particulars of all known species in the universe, along with the molecular makeup of every substance yet discovered. For the presentation, the rifle's tactical display was linked to the personal data slates of the panel, duplicating the round report for their convenience. Synthetic target, 90% rubber, 10% fibrous compound. When they looked up, she gestured to another area on the range where two enormous pigs were chained to posts on short leashes. Numbers were neatly branded onto their hindquarters in Accutech blue ink, 9 and 10. Most importantly, the K-Track system is programmed with a matrix of what each species requires to remain alive. Heart rate, respiratory function, blood toxin levels, tissue integrity, the list goes on. At its most basic level of function, K-Track will tell you if you kill what you hit. Up to the minute kill confirmation is now a battlefield reality. Please observe. Cocking the rifle, Elise spun, crouched, and snapped off two more rounds of K-Track. The first struck right in the heart of Pig-9, the rifle confirming the kill on the screens of the group. The second round wedged itself in the center of the zero painted on Pig-10's haunches. 
The beast reared and screeched in pain, staggering on bucking rear limbs, but remaining upright as blood began to trickle from the wound. Elise straightened, turned, and resumed her presentation with barely a pause. Once activated by the round impact, our nanoprobes will monitor the condition of the target in the event of a non-fatal wound, transmitting accurate data on its proximity to termination. Kinetically powered and too numerous and tiny to ever fully remove, they will go on to assess the vital signs of the target for the duration of the combat encounter. This allows it to be tracked, monitored, and evaluated in the event of even the most drawn-out conflict or manhunt. Again, she indicated the rifle readout, and the panel consulted their data slates. Porcine life form, body mass 304 pounds, fatal blood loss estimated in 7 minutes, cardio functions at 130% of baseline, critical level at 157% of baseline. Elise Blake had briefed 100 arms buyers on his many worlds, and data from the numerous smaller organizations already arming their forces with k track was streaming into corporate HQ, even as she spoke. Soon Blake Industries would have a total kill landmark under their belt, to rival the estimates of even the biggest munition manufacturers out there. The difference was, Blake Industries could prove it. It would mean her father could tout Blake products across the galaxy. Every commander in the spheres would want their troops' weapons loaded with K-Track rounds, and the demand would propel the brand to unimaginable levels. Elise was already rich, but it was never enough. Blake Industries was going all the way to the top, no matter the cost. The latest interest from Accutech, one of the largest manufacturers of them all, with its links to multiple corporation armies, and, if her rumors were true, to certain alien races, was a major step towards a new level of power for the family, such as it was. Her father, the only other living Blake, had not even extended her the courtesy of letting her know about Accutech's request for a demonstration personally. She had received her orders to take a shipment of K-Track to the secret facility on Nexus Psi through the usual shadowy network of assistance and aids. Maybe if the deal went well, just maybe, she might even earn enough of his respect to get five minutes in the same room as the man. Five minutes on the same planet would be a start. The K-Track data payload can be customized to your desired specification. She continued. You will have full control over how much data is reported and to whom. This can be transmitted not only to the user of the weapon, offering obvious tactical advantage, but also to a command post for full strategic evaluation. Think of it. In the field, a sniper will know if his distant target is successfully terminated. At your base of operations, Officers and analysts can monitor your troops' effectiveness, that of the weapons they wield, and the condition of enemy forces. And of course, she thought for Blake Industries, what better marketing tool than an indisputable scientific confirmation of success? More than this, K-Track rounds are capable of instantly identifying not only what, but potentially who they've hit. For the right price... The K-Track servers can be linked to the DNA database at Corporation Central, instantly cross-referencing target DNA for a positive ID, making K-Track an invaluable tool for law enforcement and tactical assignation. Imagine being able to prove you have got your man, especially in cases where there is not much of the target left. The laugh she had expected never came, but it didn't rattle her. Elise let the demonstration sink in for a moment as she always did at this point, staring directly at each of them, one after another. It was their turn to speak, and it was time to talk terms. A deafening alarm shattered the perfect moment Lisa had crafted. The five individuals of the Accutech party sprinted off the range towards the safety of the central command building, without a backward glance. A tremor of fear passed through her, and she followed them with haste. Perhaps his base was not as secret as Accutech believed. Before she ducked inside, she scanned the walls that enclosed the compound, the towering forest beyond it, and the twilight sky, but there was no obvious sign of danger. Inside guards were busy herding civilian staff and VIPs below ground, presumably to some unthinkably luxurious bunker complex. Elise jostled past, pausing at the entrance to the command center. Inside, she saw the senior facility staff gathered around the comm pit. A young transmissions officer, her face pale as she glanced at her superiors, was steadily cycling through the series of switches as they listened. Every button she hit returned only silence or static. No interplanetary signals of any kind, affirmed the commander, standing over her. 
She looked up and shook her head. I see. He gritted his teeth and somehow seemed to darken, as if privately acknowledging the gravity of the situation that appeared to be unfolding. He turned to his security chief. Continue with defensive protocol Alpha until we know more. The man nodded and withdrew at pace. The commander turned again to his trembling comms officer. Keep scanning for local traffic and broadcast our authentication code continuously on all bands. He spotted Elise loitering in the threshold and nodded to one of the guards who immediately headed for the door's control panel. Miss Blake, please take your assigned place below ground. We'll keep you updated as soon as we know more. She didn't have time to argue before the door hissed close, sealing the room from prying eyes. Elise cursed and turned on her heel. She climbed the stairs to the observation tower. Her mind was racing. She needed air. From up here she could gaze down into the sprawling forest and see beyond, to where the flat, glistening beaches led out to the great tumultuous ocean. A communications blackout was bad news. Everyone had heard the horror stories of strange threats emerging on new planets, and this was one of those times when these unsettling thoughts flashed through even the most educated mind. A combination of fact, fiction, and folklore. Explorers digging up more than they bargained for. Ghosts crawling out of the cracks in the earth. Planets going dark, disappearing forever without so much as a word of explanation. Now concentrate. A gentle breeze lifted a thick, sweet scent to her nostrils. The aroma of damp, flowering forest floor. The evening outside of the compound seemed calm, peaceful, and pleasant. But something was wrong. She could feel it. No transmissions meant no contact with her transport would be possible. And it would likely remain docked in orbit until collection time in two standard days. Elise looked skyward and narrowed her gaze. Three distant moons stared back at her. She had to figure out a way to get off this rock, and soon. Nexus Psi, Orbital Cargo Lanes, Fifth Sphere, The Bridge of the Aquazetta. Slouched forward in his comfrey helm pod, Tom's slumbering face drooped perilously close to a cluster of buttons that should not be pressed without good reason. But his safety harness enforced a vital cordon. A shrill, repeated tone sent him reeling upright with a wide-eyed gasp for breath. The collision warning. He frowned at the console. A curt military voice was barking at him to alter his course or be fired upon. Is this a dream? An immense laser blast rumbled across his bow. It certainly was not a dream. His eyes came to focus on a vessel up ahead, a sleek warship bristling with cannons. Open-mouthed, Tom saw a host of identical craft moving into position beyond it stretching out across the entire planet, forming up into an evenly spaced, spherical grid formation. The Nexus orbital cargo lanes, usually more or less orderly, had descended into chaos. Tom glanced down as his nav computer flickered. Nexus had disappeared from the charts. It simply wasn't there any longer. Tom looked up. There were ships diverting everywhere, nav systems scrambling to reboot and reroute. Long-distance vehicles were emerging from jumps right on top of the carnage. The comm traffic crackled with angry chatter, expletives, and military warnings. Tom hailed the nearest of the warships. Wait! Uh, hold your fire! Please, this is a cargo vessel. Aqua, Zeta, designation C-291. I am unarmed. I mean, the ship is unarmed. Repeat your- Tom's speech broke off as a shadow moved over him, covering the cockpit in darkness, blotting out the stars. It was another ship, much larger, coming in from above and behind. His hands flew to the controls, but it was too late. The vessels made contact with a deafening eruption of screeching, metallic noise, and Tom was momentarily blinded by an intense flare of light. He shielded his eyes instinctively, unable to hear his own cries of distress. The cacophony of the initial impact quickly died away, and the ship began to vibrate violently. It pitched uncontrollably upward, yawing uncomfortably. Tom gripped the sides of his pod, leaning hard to resist the disconcerting movement. He strained to reach out and tap at the controls. Nothing worked. The console sparked and flickered, and the blaring, flashing sirens on either side of the cockpit only increased his panic. This meant one thing. Get. Out. Now. Unbuckling, Tom paused as a slow, deep creaking sound echoed through the ship. Oh no. No, please. No. 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 Struggling for balance in the tilting passageway, he stumbled from the cockpit and instinctively headed towards his living quarters. A safe place? Quiet place. Sparks flew and the floor rumbled as he staggered aft. Then the ominous creaking sound stopped him once again. This time, it was louder and longer. Closer. 
He cowered for a moment, holding the railing tightly, afraid to look up. He was gripped with the fear that the vessel he had called home all these months might suddenly break in two and cast him into space. Rounding the corner, he filled with despair, seeing the passage to his quarters entirely blocked by fire and a fallen bulkhead. He approached the flames, but they beat him away, spreading aggressively with each passing moment. He staggered backward, shielding his face from the heat. What to do, what to do? A wall panel beside him exploded, the casing slamming against his shoulder and forehead. He went down hard with a scream of anguish, dazed and bleeding. As the floor trembled wildly, he began to whimper and writhe until the sobering sound of the collapsing hull brought him a jolt of primal urgency. He found his feet, sniffed back his tears, clutched his wounded shoulder and lumbered down the aft passage. It was a path he never expected to take, leading only to the emergency escape pod. He hoped it was still functional. Finding the door, he wiped dust and filth from the instruction panel beside it. The whole ship rumbled as he traced his moist, shaky finger over the lines of text, reading them for the first time. Enter safety code. Okay. Okay. One. Five. Seven. Six. Two. No. Nah. He glanced nervously behind as the fire crept closer towards him, drawing paint from the wall panels. He could see the cockpit beyond was now totally engulfed. Very soon, he would be too. Okay. Wait. One, six, seven, six, two. Yes, that's it. Okay, next. Pull lever downward. Done. Next. The flames began to lick at his suit. Sweat was running down his face, stinging his eyes. Come on, come on. Okay. Hold handle firmly and twist release lock 90 degrees clockwise. Finally, with a hiss, the door opened and he fell inside. It was a tight, upright coffin-like pod. He stepped into place and began fumbling for the straps. Clicking the buckles together triggered the closing of the door beside him. The sound of explosions growing steadily closer filled his ears as he threw a bruised arm toward the activation lever and braced himself. As the pod detached from the Aquazetta at speed, there was a dreamlike weightlessness and an eerie silence, textured only by his own panicked breathing and thundering heart. From a distance, he saw his beloved ship crumble into pieces. The Aquazetta was gone. The enormous galleon, which had rammed him, had the name of Zanzibar painted on its vast hull. It was still maneuvering at a strange angle, but the damage to it seemed far less severe. Tom wondered how many souls were aboard, and he hoped they would all make it. The pod spiraled down, sucked in by the gravity of Nexus. Rocketing past one of the warships, it came perilously close to impact. The temperature in the pod began climbing at a rapid rate. Tom poured with sweat. The intense vibrations and wild g-forces fatigued his muscles into agony as he struggled to retain composure. The curve of the planet's surface stretched out below, and before the view shield completely fogged up, he saw a forested continent, surrounded by a great body of water. On the other side of the world, a mushroom cloud was billowing in the distance, and smaller plumes of smoke could be seen here and there. He held on for as long as he could, but soon his overloaded senses ushered him beyond consciousness. The pod was a burning rock, coming in fast and out of control. Tolm fell helpless from the sky. Nexus Psi, 5th Sphere, Accutech Hidden Weapons Research Facility, Sector M83. A sudden flare of light erupted across the sky, and Elise reached up with a hand to shield her eyes. Debris streamed downward, cascading through the atmosphere, small pieces burning up into nothing as they fell. Something caught her eye, and she grabbed her goggles to take a closer look. One of the falling objects looked like it might land within a mile or so of the compound. She brought it into focus. This was no meteor, no shard of hull. That looks like an escape pod. She tracked it, marking its path. Sure enough, automated landing thrusters fired just before it fell below the tree line and passed from her field of view. Did that come down in the ocean? Her mind raced, considering her ever-dwindling options. Whoever was in there, they had to know something about what the hell was going on. She was suddenly filled with the urge to act. It was risky, but the information was vital to her escape. Finding that pod was the only positive course of action. She wasn't one to sit around and wait. She would go after it. The place was filled with prototype weapons, armor, and other gear, but Elise needed to travel light if she was going to bring back whoever or whatever was in that pod. She grabbed the X-Acta rifle, filled her hip pouches with K-Track, and took an oxygen mask just in case she needed to dive. She estimated the crash site was less than 30 minutes away if she made good time. And she would have to, if she wanted to avoid being out there after dark. 
The corridors of the facility were busy with small groups hurrying to gather their possessions and flee below ground. Elise took advantage of the chaos to slip out of the service exit and gently pull it closed behind her. It felt good to be out, to be taking action, but nervousness stirred inside her as she took a lingering look at the looming forest into which she was about to venture on foot. Rounding the first defensive buttress of the compound, she saw a line of prototype hover bikes parked neatly in their camouflage bays. She couldn't help but crack a half-smile. No plan. Passing through the dense woodland seemed like a bad idea on the bike. It was clearly in its element on open ground. Elise was relieved to emerge from the dense claustrophobia, descending to flat open beach. Whipping through the spray, now she could really pick up some speed. The bike was pacey, to say the least. It took a few minutes before she dared to fully open the throttle, before her eyes were configured to interpret the landscape as anything more than a blur at that kind of speed. She had marked the pod coming down somewhere close to the far end of the forested peninsula. Elise sped along the beach, throwing up a fine spray in her wake, watchful for burning shards from overhead. With the ocean on one side, and the forest on the other, the only way was forward. There were further explosions in the sky as she rode, and debris continued to rain down. Her sense of dread deepened as she wove between the smoking craters. In the tree line as she passed, she was almost sure that shapes were moving, shadows creeping, watching and following, heading in the same direction. She let herself admit that she may not be the only one who saw where the pod came down. She had to hurry. Elise hunched forward and squeezed as much speed from the machine as she could. She was forced to slam on her air brakes as someone came staggering out of the forest, right across her path. She barely kept control as she brought the bike to a sliding sideways halt. Her anger was immediately diffused when she saw the woman covered in blood, limping, hunched over with one arm held against her belly, and the other waving for assistance. Elise dismounted and ran up to her. The woman was clutching a nasty gash across her midriff, which was still leaking blood at an alarming rate. What was left of her technician's overalls were torn with what looked like claw marks. Marks which evidently had also brutally torn her skin beneath. She was out of breath, weeping, wheezing, and jabbering with a mad fervor. They're dead? All dead? Help me, please. He's right behind me. Okay, slow down. Elise placed a hand on her shoulder, trying to calm the woman, to reassure. Tell me what's going on. Who are you? Where are you stationed? She was clearly a colonist, but Elise hadn't remembered seeing her at the Accutech facility. The closest colony was the mining station W-4, a larger settlement some miles away. I don't understand. The woman muttered. It just happened. Latuki, he, he changed. They all changed. She stared vacantly at the floor, as if lost in recalling of some memory too horrific to express. She gasped and flinched as a long, hoarse roar sounded from within the forest behind them. Oh no. The woman looked back. They're coming! They're coming! Please help me! Elise leveled her gun at the tree line in the direction from which the sound had come from, gesturing for the woman to get behind her. What's coming? She whispered urgently. It... it... it's... Elise turned to look the woman square in the eye. What the hell is it? At that moment, a frantic humanoid creature burst from the forest with furious hostility, bellowing a terrifying cry. It paused, sniffed the air locked eyes on the pair of females, and came sprinting towards them. Elise snapped into highly trained action without a moment's thought. She took a pace towards the assailant and dropped to one knee, eye in the gun sight. It came for her, claws raised, and suddenly took off, leaping into the air. Elise reeled backwards, following its ascent with the muzzle, and struck it with a controlled three-round burst. It hit the sand right beside her and lay motionless. The rifle confirmed the kill. Unknown life form. Elise walked over to the body. It was somewhat like a man, but larger, disproportionate, and hideous. His uniform color and insignia seemingly matched the woman's, but what was left of his clothing was stretched, torn, and draped over his grotesquely mutated muscles and the jutting, deformed promontories of his exterior bones. Elise turned to help the woman, but found her already on the ground, moaning and writhing. She crouched beside her and cradled her head. The woman opened her eyes weakly grabbed a handful of Elise's bodysuit, and through gritted teeth uttered a desperate plea, her eyes alive with intense suggestion. Help me. At that moment, she became racked with energetic spasms of agony. She cramped up, limbs contorting, then flailing, throwing up sand, jaw gnashing, her skin reddened, her cheekbones bulged, stretching, and pushed through the flesh of her face, her neck thickening. 
The next time she opened her eyes, it was a disturbing, almost satisfied smile that bared a row of sharp, uneven teeth. Elise staggered back, shocked at the sudden change, and raised her weapon. It was clear that this woman was no longer the person she had once been. Elise hesitated, then helped her the only way she knew how. A single round delivered to the brain. She would have taken a moment or two longer to reflect, but another roar echoed through the forest behind her. It was not safe to stay, and there was no turning back. She found it somehow comforting to climb aboard the bike once more. It felt solid beneath her, reliable. Scanning, she quickly picked up the plume of smoke that marked her object and hit the throttle. What she had just seen was the stuff of nightmares. Her mind was flooded with questions as she powered along the beach. What happened to those people? What the hell happened over at W4? Up ahead, a little way out of the shallows, a black shape resolved into a group of five lumbering humanoid figures gathered around what had to be the smoking escape pod. She eased off on the throttle. An unfamiliar twinge crept in her gut. More. The pod was planted upright in a few feet of water and looked as though it had taken quite a beating. It was being circled gingerly by the creatures, sized up with a mixture of curiosity and reticence. She brought the bike to a complete stop about 30 yards away, but she was already too close. One of the largest two seemed to pick up her scent, sniffing at the air. It tossed its head in her direction with a grunt. At that, the others broke off and began to make their way towards her. Three of them shambled forward in a parody of humanity. The fourth was more agile, prowling, menacing. Still astride the bike, Elise grabbed the rifle strapped to her back and leveled it at the approaching beasts. They paused and exchanged looks. She blasted a shot over their heads. Maybe she could scare them off. Run, just run. It didn't work. The larger one bellowed, raising a grotesque claw in her direction, and the other three broke into a scampering, rabid charge. Flicking the rifle to automatic, Elise unleashed a ferocious K-track burst on the nearest, ripping its torso diagonally in two, as if it had been sliced by an industrial laser blade. Kill confirmed. She booted the hover bike into action and clung on as it sprinted right towards the other two. As the mutants tried to dive clear, she swung the bike around, slamming its body into the closest of the monsters. There was a sickening crunch of shattered bone, and an arc of blood flew into the air as the creature dropped in a mushy heap of gore. Braced for impact, Elise threw herself clear of the bike, hitting the sand in a ball and rolling smoothly to her feet, gun up and ready to acquire the next target. The creature which had dived clear was still reeling, scrambling to its feet, in the shallow water, snarling and baring its teeth. It looked like it had once been a female science officer of some sort. It splashed water in her direction, then fumbled for a holstered pistol at its side. Its head splattered as Elise blasted it from the hip. The rifle hummed pleasantly as it readied rounds for the next strike. She turned to take on the last, the largest. It wasn't there. Behind. It was too late. A claw clamped heavily around her neck knocking the breath from her lungs. She felt the creature's inhuman strength in its hot, stinging breath on the side of her face as it drew her close. Screaming, she dropped to one knee under its weight. With all her might, she managed to flip the rifle towards herself, aiming just wide of her own torso, ramming the weapon back hard, right into the body of the attacker. As she felt its teeth sinking into the soft flesh above her collarbone, she closed her eyes and unleashed a blast in point-blank rage. She screamed in agony as the heat of the barrel seared the flesh under her arm, and the firepower threw them both to the ground. Elise staggered to her feet and turned to see the monster writhing in the sand, stomach blown out, but somehow still alive. It seemed to be smiling up at her as she fingered the bite on her neck. Oh no, please no. She wiped the smile off its face with a volley that removed its jaw completely. Fighting back tears, steeled with denial, she stumbled in the direction of the pod, clutching the wound on her neck. Beneath her hand, she could already feel it beginning to harden over hot and throbbing. Her vision began to swim, and an invading nausea was stirring in her belly. She felt her bones creak, swelling with new growth, and she knew she didn't have much time. There was one more to deal with, the big one, its bone armor thicker than the others. It was thumping on the hatch of the pod, utterly absorbed with it, and showing her its back. She had the advantage. She waded out towards it, breathing hard, her thoughts growing cloudy. A chunk of debris slammed into the water nearby, drenching her in spray and concealing her in filthy smoke for a moment. She stepped through it cautiously. Soaked and shivering with fever, she gripped her weapon and edged closer. Nexus Psi, Fifth Sphere, Sector M83, The Shores of the Great Ocean 
Tom awoke to pain and noise. A metallic banging echoed in his tortured eardrums as his eyes came to focus on the pod lightly encasing him, and he remembered the crash. His feet were wet. He started, unsure whether it might be his own blood, but as his sense returned, he smelled the thick, briny scent of seawater. Groaning, he began to unstrap, stiff and sore, and tapped at the pod controls. It was no use. They were fried, wet and sparking. The muffled sound of explosions and gunfire sounded in the distance, and he remembered the ominous carnage he had seen on the way in. How long have I been out? Tom froze as something hammered on the hatch of the pod, right in front of his face. The condensation-covered view shield took a heavy blow and cracked. He wiped the moisture aside and recoiled in horror. A monstrous face, all exposed muscle and sinew and snarling teeth, was peering in at him, mouth foaming. What is that? It slammed another fist into the plexiglass, cracking it further. He frantically searched, but the pod was not equipped with anything he could possibly use to defend himself. Pulling back an oversized fist, it poised to strike the glass again. Tom winced, waiting for the blow, but instead the creature disintegrated, coating the pod in a splatter of blood and gore. After a moment, a smaller gloved hand wiped a gap in the muck, and through the view shield, a human face appeared. A beautiful, determined set of hazel eyes frowned in at him, framed by a pale skin and scattered freckles. The face vanished. There was a blast, and the hatch opened. You couldn't hear what her lips were mouthing, but it seemed urgent, desperate. She looked exhausted, sick, but it was clear that she was trying to help him. He tried to raise his arms and reach out to her, but only one obeyed. The other was without feeling, as were his legs. She hauled him over her shoulder, out of the pod, and after a few steps they fell onto the beach. He was beginning to hear a little better, but her words did not make any sense. She was breathless, almost whispering. Who is she? Do you hear me? I need you to kill me. What? Why? No! He said astonished. Look, something is happening to me. I may not have long. She pointed to the gruesome wound on her neck and grimaced with pain. It looked serious, veins bulging the surrounding skin darkening even as he watched. We're both wounded. We need to find a med- He reached out a hand, but Elise batted it away. No, you fool. I, I'm i infected or something. She bent forward, <laughs> coughing uncontrollably. Infected? Tom withdrew his hand, backing away, looked her up and down. What do you mean? Look, I've seen it happen. She coughed again. There was black bile seeping from her mouth. She straightened and gestured over her shoulder. See those? Tom saw that several more creatures were emerging from within the forest edge, descending the beach, heading right towards them. What are they? I don't know, but I'm pretty sure they used to be just like us. Get up! Huddled together, the wounded pair found their feet, and with their backs to the ocean, slowly retreated into the water as the snarling pack moved to surround them. I don't think I can do it myself. If I... Change, you'll have to shoot me, okay? Whatever happens, don't let me become one of them, understand? Her voice was hoarse with desperation. Tom was terrified. This was moving too fast. Change? Who is she? What are those things? He wouldn't do it. He would never kill a person. He found himself mumbling. Wait, no, let's think about this. Surely there must be a way to stop them. Oh, hells. It's happening. She slammed the gun into his arms and he grabbed it out of sheer reflex. At least took hold of the barrel and aimed it against her chest. Shoot here, please! She pleaded in agony. Now! He couldn't do it. She grabbed his hand and forced it into position on the trigger. He shook his head. He wouldn't do it. One of Alice's eyes bulged over its socket, pulsating in blood red. She buckled over in pain, clutching her stomach and retching. With a cracking, grinding sound, her shoulders began to bulk, and a piece of collarbone jutted out with a nauseating crunch. Her grip on his hand became intensely strong. She roared at him. It was not a word, but a feral, mad scream, as she battled to cling to the last of her humanity. Tom recoiled in genuine fear, trying to break free of her grasp. As they wrestled, the trigger was pulled, and a violent burst of case rack ripped through her heart. Elise Blake fell face down, in the shallows, lapping waves to the great ocean. Tom looked down in dismay at the instrument of death in his blood-soaked hands. Kill confirmed. Sigma 9, Second Sphere Financial District, Blake Industries HQ. Finally it came. The numbers fell neatly into place. 
Blank-faced, Mr. Blake popped the cork from a bottle of the finest champagne, cut the limp, frothy overspill in a thin flute, and then slowly raised his arm in a lazy toast to the empty room. One billion dead souls and counting. This was a landmark worth celebrating.